Welcome to the Creative Me podcast, coming to you from Guernsey in the Channel Islands. Hello and welcome to episode 18 of the Creative Me podcast. I have an extra special episode for you today. It's an interview with Frank Degenar. I've pronounced his surname wrong, he's going to tell me off. (laughs) Author of the fantastic book, Do Way, Way More in Workflowy. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you'll know that I'm a huge fan of the Workflowy productivity app. Frank is the Workflowy guru, so it's a real thrill to talk to him about his book, about Workflowy, about his creative process and all of that sort of creative goodness. We had a great chat. This episode is way longer than it normally would be because Frank had so much good stuff to say, so I really hope you enjoy it. In the interview, we talk a bit about how Frank and I got to know each other. Incidentally, he lives in Brazil, and as many of you know, I'm in Guernsey, so there's about a four-hour time difference. We managed to find a, a suitable time for both of us to chat. We're also going to mention an exciting project, a collaboration we've got on the horizon. So without further ado, let me introduce Frank to you. Hello, Frank. Hey, Martin. Nice to be speaking to you this morning. My morning, your afternoon, right? Exactly that. Thank you so much for agreeing to appear on the Creative Me podcast. You're actually the first interview I've ever done on the show. I guess that makes me creative. I have to sound more creative now, right? You're definitely creative, and we're going to talk more about that in a moment. Um, I actually think the story of how we got to this stage of chatting on Skype is quite an interesting one, and I'm going to share that with the listeners now, if that's okay with you. Go for it. So Frank is a writer. You don't feel weird about me calling you a writer, hopefully. I'm still warming up to it. I wrote one book and I blog, but I still consider myself more of an English teacher, actually. But <laughs> I'm warming up. I'm warming to it. I think you're a writer. All you have to do to be a writer is write. So <laughs> we'll beg to differ. <laughs> um, but the reason uh, Frank and I are in touch with each other is because Frank wrote a book, as he said. And this book was about an app that I really love called Workflowy. It's a productivity app. So I read the book. And I thought, yeah, this is a really good book. It taught me everything I wanted to know and more. And it made me smile as well, which is not really what you expect from a technical book. So in this, you know, internet enabled day and age, I thought I'll email the author. And the author was Frank. So I said, hi, Frank, I think your book's great. Tried not to be too fangirly, of course. And Frank emailed back and here we are today. We got chatting. That's pretty much the size of it, isn't it, Frank? Yeah, actually, some of the best emails I've gotten from readers, um, stroke my ego, you know, <laughs> are ones that told not so much about the technical stuff, because I, you know, I don't want to sound all arrogant here, but I knew the technical aspect of my book was sound. And the ideas I put forth, like the technical stuff was good, you know, because I worked really hard at that, I developed some systems, but the style of the book um, is something that a lot of people commented on, I commented on, I wasn't expecting that at all, because You know, I'm not an experienced writer, Uh, first book I wrote, and a lot of people just flat out, you know, commented, wow, I love your writing, you're a great writer, you made me giggle, you made me laugh, and that was really good, that was good for my ego. Excellent, and I can can genuinely agree with those people. Um, You've obviously got a very original writing voice, and that's something that I definitely like to see you put into other books. Have you got any thoughts about that? 
Well, I'm juggling on one side my English teaching career. You know, I teach English. I teach private classes from home. Um, and the productivity scene has been something sort of unexpected that I've moved into these last couple of years. You know, I started blogging and whatnot. Um, so this is still fresh for me. I wrote the book almost a year ago, and I don't really see myself getting into, and I didn't, at least I didn't see myself getting into um, anything else productivity rate related, especially not motivational, um, you know, general sort of productivity, motivating people in the general sense. Um, for now, I just thought it would stick to Workflowy, but I'm warming up to the idea of um, moving more into the productivity scene and seeing what else um, we can come up with, maybe in collaboration. Mm, that's an interesting word, collaboration. More on that later. <laughs> so tell <laughs> tell me how you ended up writing a book about Workflowy. I mean, clearly you use the app. I use the app. I know it's a really great app, but you know, most people will just go ahead, download an app and, and like it and maybe tweet about it. But you, Frank, you wrote a book about it. How did that come about? Well, um, let's talk about money. <laughs> oh, I understand. <laughs> yeah. You know, they say necessity is the mother of invention. And for me, um, at this like point in the history of time here in Brazil, we're going through quite a, a bit of a recession. And so last year, mid-year, I thought, you know, I've got to pull myself out of this financial situation. The economy is not doing too great here in Brazil. And um, let, me, let me write a book. I've got some ideas. Let me see what comes of this. And so there was that. I had been planning to write a book on Evernote, but it went the workflowy way because um, as I was pouring my information into workflowy, like transferring my information from um, you know, different sources into Workflowy to get this Evernote book written, I just came up with um, really amazing ways, and actually surprised myself, really amazing ways of using Workflowy and building new workflows, and I realized how uh, flexible it was. So I ended up changing my mind uh, mid-stride and saying, well, let's, let's write a book on Workflowy. And um, I started over a period of a couple of months, I just started like documenting, like writing down, taking notes on the things that I discovered. And once I had quite a sizable um, repertoire of stuff that I thought other people might want to know, you know, that I hadn't seen anywhere, anywhere on the internet, um, I thought, well, let's do this. Let's write a book. But um, it was like game time. I had to get it done quickly. I had to put pressure on myself um, before the end of the year, you know. And it became a very personal, very intense uh, personal goal to get this book done. So I guess um, the ideas were always there, but the motivating factor was, you know, like I said, necessity is the mother of invention. I had to do something to sort of better my financial situation here in Brazil. Now, I've spoken about Workflowy on the podcast quite a bit, but from the point of view of uh, just say just say a listener has never used it before. Could you explain a bit about what Workflowy is and does and why it's so great? Well, we're going to have to backtrack just briefly, just a little bit um, back to maybe mid 2013. I'll make this real short. <laughs> that was like the start of my productivity journey when I got my first uh, iPhone. So I started tinkering around with a lot of apps and I read some amazing books on GTD. I think you're, you're a productivity guru yourself. So <laughs> I read books on GTD, the Pomodoro technique, Kanban and all of that. And I started creating like this mashup of my own system. And I cycled through, I ran the gauntlet of, um, you know, like most people do, a bunch of apps. And I eventually came up against uh, Workflowy. And the really cool thing about Workflowy is that I discovered that any one of these productivity systems, like the ones I've mentioned and more, you can, they have their incarnation in Workflowy. I basically cannot find uh, any productivity system technique or method that you cannot recreate in some shape or form in Workflowy. And that's what's really exciting for me. Um, as you know, I've got this blog, Productivity Mashup. And I, I'm all for like building your own system, your own tailor-made system. So you take a little bit of that from this system. I mean, I don't prescribe 100% to GTD. Um, I take the meaty, um, good parts of it that I consider great. And I encourage people to take bits and pieces from different systems and create their own thing. And this is what Workflow is so great about. And um, you don't hear people speaking about that a lot, but I really got onto that 
that aspect of um, how it could hold any productivity system that you wanted to get into it. And basically, you create your own productivity system from the ground up. Um, when you start with Workflow, as you know, once upon a time, you signed up and you started with just one little bullet and there was nothing else. You basically mm -hmm. created from scratch, from the ground up. That's quite um, intimidating, that one little bullet, that sort of blank slate. It is. And it's uh, deceptively simple. People would say, you know, let's put my shopping, my grocery list in here and, you know, list of 100 things they might want to buy. And it's just so much more than that. It's not just a list taking app. Um, kind of one of my pet hates is when I hear people saying this is a list app. For me, it's much more than a list app. I wouldn't really describe it as a list app, but that at face value right off the bat is what a lot of people um, see it to be. So it's simple. Anybody can understand it. Anybody can tinker around with it, but you can really build layers into it. And that's what's really great for a tinkerer like myself. Excellent. Um, and one of the best things for people listening is that Workflowy is a free app. There is, it's a free, there's a freemium option, I believe, so you can upgrade to get extra bits and bobs, but ultimately it's a free app, so anybody who likes the sound of it can just go ahead and download it. There's also a web-based version if you don't have a smartphone. Uh, so I would encourage everyone listening to have a try, and you? Yeah, you get the full functionality of everything right off the bat. Um, you know, but then you're limited to 250 lists a month. But the cool thing is this. I mean, if you're going to be using it in your first month and you create 250 lists, you're, you're actually getting into it. And um, if you're using it at that level, I mean, 250 lists is not that much, actually. But if you're using it to that level, you've already caught on to how awesome it is. And, you know, paying like, what, five bucks a month is really nothing. So what other things can you use Workflowy for then? You said earlier shopping list, a uh, list of things you want to buy. I don't know. I'm thinking bucket list, um, <laughs> you know, 20 things to do before you die type thing. But what else? I've heard a rumor that you can actually write a book on Workflowy. What do you think about that? I wrote my book in Workflow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful so, transition it, there, did you notice? <laughs> Tell us about that. Tell us about the process of writing the book and that, you know, writing to selling the book, but also the workflowy element within it. Well, a lot of people, um, it's very rare to come across people who say, like, Workflowy is um, a text editor. You know, I don't hear people saying that, but to me, I think it's one of the most amazing text editors. Um, and there's a lot that you can do to shape it the way, uh, in such a way that you feel comfortable writing in Workflowy, you know, on your, in your browser. Um, I've written about a lot of that in my book, but you can shape Workflowy to be the exact environment that you want. You know, the aesthetics, um, also a whole bunch of practical stuff. So it's an amazing text editor. And I really caught onto that and started writing my book in Workflowy, um, not only lists, but paragraphs, um, you organize chapters and concepts, and it's just amazing. It connects everything in the most beautiful way. Um, so the process, um, you got any specific questions on the process? I I, right I, I'm interested in um, whether you wrote things in order. And how, in order. And how long you spent writing, perhaps. Oh, wow. Um, a five-month period. This is very intensive. A uh, yeah. five-month period. I spent roughly six hundred hours. I've got this all documented, so in you work, can work <laughs> You can work out how many hours I spent on average a day. Like all of my free time was sucked up. And um, in fact, at the beginning of my book and the dedication, I wrote something like, uh, "Each pomodoro spent on this book meant less beach time for you," meaning my daughter Emma. Oh. And we love to go to the beach, but uh, she really sacrificed a lot of beach time during those five months. So it was one hard slog. I really put my all into it for five months. Um, I don't know if I'd do that again. I prefer to have more of a balanced life, but I put a lot of time into this book. And, um, you know, I was, I had set a, a goal that I needed to get it done by a specific time. So, yeah, that's how much time I put in. Um, I didn't really listen to uh, the advice I, I would usually give of, you know, um, balancing your day and doing exercise and stuff. I think I'm 
I'm a whole lot more balanced now, but I was under the gun and I gave it everything. So it's a 254 page book and um, that's a lot. That's a lot to write. And you outlined in Workflowy, you wrote the whole thing in Workflowy. Um, how did you, did you start at the beginning and go to the end or did you just sort of dip in and out of chapters? How did that sort of the outlining and the putting meat on the bones kind of thing work? Well, it began with just a bunch of random ideas. Everything I, every time I came up with something, um, a new way of using Workflowy, I had a special outline where I would just pop it in. And after a couple of months when I said, now's the time to actually get writing the book, uh, we're starting, this is it. Um, I had to sift through all of the ideas and tag them. That's one of the little features about Workflow is tagging. So you, I went through, I sifted through everything and I gave it a specific tag to give it its own category. And uh, when you hit a tag, let's say you're going to talk about tags. I mean, that's a big topic in my book, tags. So I might say, ah, oh, here's an idea on tags. And I would tag it with tag, hashtag tag. And once I'd gone through everything, um, you click on the hashtag and you'll see all your ideas spread out throughout the outline in one consolidated list, condensed. Um, so the cool thing about workflow is that you get categories within categories. You don't necessarily have to be um, super organized, but um, there's different perspectives of looking at things. So there's a lot of shuffling. And that's the nice thing about workflow too, is um, it's easy to shuffle things around. And it's, I found for a long time, I found it really uh, difficult to, to put this into words, um, sort of how Workflowy did this. But uh, the thing is that it's intuitive. That's really what I want to say. It's intuitive. You, you kind of figure it out as you go along. And you'll, you'll come up um, with ways and methods of doing things that you'll find hard to put into words. But that's, that's like the one overriding thing I can say about Workflow is the more you put your information into it and shuffle things around, it becomes intuitive. And that's what scares a lot of people as they keep putting a lot of stuff into Workflow. They want it neatly packaged according to, let's say, GTD. And you can organize your stuff in broad categories like reference material projects, etc. But if you're really going to get the best out of it, um, and it's going to be a reflection of what's in your mind, in your brain, um, it's going to become more organic. And you're going to find um, structures and ways of organizing things that don't fit in with you know, traditional um, productivity models. So, And that's scary to a lot of people. It's, it's scary for them to come out of that mindset of um, everything doesn't have to be categorized according to GTD. Everything doesn't have to be logical according to what uh, most people would expect you know and um, so it becomes organic and it just builds and grows and what's important is to be able to get to your information and find your information real quick and uh, that's what I write about a lot in the book on how to navigate around workflow as opposed to getting it into the perfect structure everybody's workflow in the end their one zoomable document is going to be way different from the next person's You've created this book. You're really happy with it. What happens now in the kind of book production process? Do you proofread it yourself? Do you get someone else in? How do you go about selling it and packaging it up? Well, basically, I did this on a shoestring. Um, spend as little money as possible. So I actually spent zero. You spent nothing. <laughs> wow. How much did I spend on this? Um, it was just blood, sweat, and tears, Martin. I'll tell you um, a little bit about that. Basically, I wrote everything in Workflowy itself. And after doing a bit of preliminary research, I figured that InDesign, um, which I already had on my computer, InDesign, you familiar with that? Yes, yes. Yeah, um, that was, I was considering going with like Microsoft Word, it was possible, but um, I thought InDesign was like what most self-publishers, what most respectable self-publishers would try and put their books into. Um, so it took me like a month of my free time to learn just enough about um, InDesign to come up with a half decent um, structure for my book and some design concepts. And I am by no means a design person, um, but if you play around with something long enough, you're gonna come up with something half decent. And um, my book is not a work of design, it's not like this masterpiece of design. It's simple and I think it reflects the workflow app itself. But um, 
InDesign was really instrumental and helpful in being able to create like master pages, you know, automate stuff. And so I really put in a lot of time, like a month of all of my free time into learning InDesign. Um, in the book, I shared a couple of uh, animated GIFs with links that I connect to Evernote notes. So I just had, I already had an Evernote uh, account. Um, I have a premium account. And um, what else? Netflix, Netflix subscription. Maybe that's what I had. <laughs> well, funny to mention Netflix because that was a source of a lot of my research over months and months and months prior to writing the book and during the book. And by that, I mean, there's a lot of science fiction TV series there on Netflix. And I, I draw on a lot of references, especially science fiction in my book. Um, and Netflix was made that real easy to get to those Star Trek TV series and um, all the TV series that I actively watched so that I could get material from to make references. And um, Dropbox, I use Dropbox as well to put my images in and through a, um, a markdown process, markdown writing. You familiar with markdown? I am, yes, but some of the listeners yeah. might not be, so it'd be worth explaining what that is. Well, I write about it in the book. Um, I don't know if I could summarize this so quickly. I have this tendency to be long-winded. Um, <laughs> markdown, there's only like five or six little tags or things to remember about markdown. So like imagine you're writing in a text document and you cannot bold or italicize anything in a text document. So how would you on the simplest of, um, with the simplest of tools, like just a little text file, be able to show when you exported it that something you wanted to be italicized or in bold or underlined, uh, etc. And it was just for the sake of these simple little um, emphases like italics. I mean, I live for italics, um, italic. And in my book, I use it a lot. It's part of my sarcasm. It's part of the way I write. And italic is pretty important to me. And that was, I guess, what got me onto um, Markdown itself is that when I exported my stuff at the end of the day from Workflowy, I wanted to make sure that I wouldn't lose any of the italicized stuff or any of the stuff that I had bolded. And what Markdown does, um, simple example, is if you want to italicize something, you could... Um, Put an underscore or an asterisk both both before and after the word like you enclose you tag the word you wrap it in um asterisks or is that what's the plural for asterisk that's a really good question let's is? <laughs> as, as, asterisk is i don't know <laughs> yes yeah, so you wrap something in asterisks at one asterisk on both sides it's going to indicate um italics and when you put it through a markdown editor that's a whole other story um, it appears as um, just as you'd want it to be. So it's the thing about um, Markdown, there's very few things to remember actually, um, is that it's going to be scalable. No matter where you write it, um, you're going to be able to export it and put it into any platform. You just put it through very, very quickly through a Markdown editor and you're going to have all the emphases that you want and different heading sizes, etc. So I'm really a Markdown fan with my writing. I write a lot in that. And um, it was exciting. It was an exciting process. You know, a lot of the stuff that I discovered about Workflowy was as I was writing the book. I would go so far as to say maybe 50% of the stuff I write about is stuff I discovered while writing the book. So anyway, um, lost track of my thoughts here. Mm, Just explained okay. a little bit about Markdown. Yeah, and we were t you were talking about the tools that you you used in order to create the book, and then I guess the stage after that is getting it ready for sale. Yeah. Um, that took a bit of research. So, I, yeah, I think the, the question that you, the original question you asked was, um, you know, the whole process of writing the book, did I find an editor? Did I, um, basically it was just me, myself, and I. <laughs> I learned um, the, I learned about InDesign. I obsessively um, edited my stuff. I've got a, a bit of a different approach to editing um, or actually revising stuff. A lot of people write a first draft of a book or a body of work. What I do is I obsess about a single sentence. I obsess about a paragraph and I keep reworking it so that it doesn't have um, the usual cliches. And, and I, I just rework it until I'm happy with it. And as a perfectionist, like a lot of people say this, so um, it's very difficult to be happy with your work, you know, but 
what I do is I rework it obsessively, and that's why it takes me so long to do certain things. But I rework stuff until I'm real happy with it, and then I move on. And when I get to the end of the book, um, or whatever I'm writing, there's very little to edit and very little to correct, very little to change at the end. Um, so it was, it's my sort of weird um, editing process, but I did look, read over it at the end for spelling mistakes and stuff like that. Um, I had a lot of challenges. One of them, I, one of the things I didn't know a lot about was copyright, you know, copyright laws. As a blogger, having blogged for just a couple of years, um, we're all familiar with the concept of fair use, meaning that you can take copyrighted material like maybe audio, visual, photos, uh, quotes, and things like that um, for non-commercial use. And as long as it's for education or, or criticism, stuff like that, you know, for the media. And, and of course, you're going to give it its credits when you blog about it. But um, coming from that background, it was a bit of a paradigm shift, maybe not called a paradigm, not so big of a shift, but um, I really had to come to grips with, you know, I cannot just put this in my book like what I can do in my blog posts. And a couple of interesting things I did was I wanted my book to be visual. So there's a bunch of screenshots and I wanted to include um, you know, visual stuff about my references, like the science fiction references. If I was going to talk about um, Spock from Star Trek, I wanted to have a picture of him, but you know that was kind of where I came up against a dead end. And there's this site called The Noun Project. I'm sure you've heard of that, right? I am very familiar with The Noun Project. That, I love it. That was a godsend for me because a lot of, even though I wasn't getting, like, say, a full-blown color picture of Spock or, um, you know, the Matrix or a picture of a scene from um, the Game of Thrones, I found a lot of really cool icons that were representative of the references that I wanted to talk about. And in the process, I discovered that, you know, they also helped me to keep my books feel a little bit more minimalist. That's what I wanted. That's what Workflow is about. And, um, you know, not have it so flashy. So I found tons of really great icons, sometimes exactly what I was looking for. Sometimes I had to um, bend the reference a little bit, but it was all like symbolic of what I wanted to talk about. And I think these, the visual part of those um, now project icons were a huge part of my book. Um, at least it went, it went far in making me feel satisfied about the end product, you know. Um, so I used a lot of noun project icons. Um, I also, in terms of copyright, I'm just used to using any old uh, font that I come across downloaded from the internet. And I really, really wanted to use a font called Gotham. Right. You've heard of I love Gotham. I, I've used it. I just think it's aesthetic. And when I went to research and find out how much it would cost for like commercial use, putting it into a book, it didn't really cost a certain amount. You had to pay per, you have to like uh, sign a contract with these guys or something like that um, and get a license for however many books you were going to produce. So it was kind of complicated and I think it was way out of most people's price bracket, you know. And I really, really wanted Gotham, but I also didn't want to overstep the mark and use stuff that could potentially come back to me and people saying, you know, do you have a license? I don't know how it works. <laughs> like if you've got like font police who, who like go through books and, and see like if people are using fonts illegally, but I want to do everything above board. You know, even though this wasn't going to be like a New York Times bestseller or anything, I wanted to do everything above board. So I, I researched a bit. And I found a Montserrat, um, it's kind of like a Gotham lookalike or um, doppelganger. It's like a sort of like a fake Gotham. And it comes very, very close, this Montserrat um, font family. So I used that in my book. And it sort of looks like Gotham, looks very clo close. And I'm really, really pleased with the results. It's like an imitation of Gotham. Um, one of the challenges I had with that is that Gotham doesn't have italic. So <laughs> I love italic. So what I had to do in InDesign was not too difficult. Um, you create fake italic in InDesign by using their skew tool, 
So you can skew it like between 10 to 15 degrees or something like that. And uh, you got italic. So I really had to work around a lot of these issues to get what I wanted, but it's possible. It's possible if um, not only just putting words into a book, but looking at the design of it, the fonts, um, the visual aspects, there's a lot that you can do if you really put your mind to it and um, avoid copyright issues. So um, those were some of the details that I had to learn about. This was all part of the learning process, uh, learning um, InDesign software, um, trying to get the visual aspect of my book um, to a place where I'd be happy with it. And um, yeah, from start to finish, I, I had to learn everything, all the skills. I think it would have been a lot quicker if I had had somebody on board, but I was doing this on like a shoestring and uh, it was going to, I had like a zero budget. I didn't want to put any money into it um, until I was actually selling something. Then I would actually, you know, um, consider buying or paying for people's services once I actually started making money from that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And actually, I think it's a really sensible business model. And for anybody listening who's thinking, I really want to write a book, but I don't have any money to put into it, you've just demonstrated really well that it can be done. Um, so that makes complete sense. Can I ask you about how you sell your book? Because it's it's an ebook. What? Where do you yeah. sell it? How does that work? I sell it on my blog. I've got a book landing page. It's self-hosted. Um, I have a Squarespace site. I don't think that's very relevant. I like Squarespace. Um, so I tweaked it a little bit to create my own landing page on my blog. And what I do is I sell it through PayPal and Gumroad. Gumroad is a digital platform where you can sell a whole bunch of stuff. They automate things for you. But um, PayPal is pretty big. Some people hate it, but most people are inclined to go through um, to go through PayPal. So like I'd say like 95, maybe like 99% of the books that I sell are on are through PayPal and uh, a couple through Gumroad, you know, those for the people who just turned off by PayPal for some reason. But um, the process is through PayPal and, you know, I've forgotten a lot of the details. Once I set it up, I think I forgot a couple of the details, but let me see if I can remember here. Um, what happens is when somebody buys, they click on a button on my site, a PayPal button, um, a new page opens up and you're going to go through the whole PayPal process, put in your details. Um, and a lot of people already have PayPal um, accounts, so that makes it real easy for them. And um, what I've done is within my PayPal dashboard, when I've, where I created these buttons, like you, you say it's going to be like $10, or my book's going to be $20 or nineteen ninety five. Um, you've got a little, you've got a... Um, a dashboard where you can actually um, tailor make the look of your button. You can tell, I guess you can tell PayPal how it's going to interact with your mailing system like MailChimp. So I use MailChimp to uh, collect emails. And what happens when somebody purchases a book from PayPal, it triggers a, it puts their email address on a list in MailChimp. And in turn, MailChimp will send out an email with a download link to a PDF that is hosted in Dropbox. So does that sound a little complicated? No, that makes complete sense to me. That's a, that's a really good explanation of your workflow, actually. So I, I've i actually gone to Dropbox Premium or Pro, whatever they call it. But at the time, I was just on like the free Dropbox. And that was perfect. That was more than enough. So I've got my, my 26 megabyte book. It's heavy because it's got a lot of graphics in. Um, I've got my book in Dropbox and um, people don't automatically get uh, sent the book. It's too big to fit into an email. I think it was just over the Gmail limit of 25 megabytes or something like that. But um, I email a nice little welcome or a thank you email to people saying, hey, here's your download link. Thanks for the purchase. And, uh, you know, so that's my automated system. That's really interesting. Uh, that's, yeah. I have been researching um, online selling platforms a little bit recently, and um, Gumroad does look to have a fantastic service, but they don't use pay they, they don't offer the PayPal integration. So I can see why you'd be using both. Certainly, in my experience, there's a lot of people who naturally gravitate towards PayPal. So it's quite interesting to hear you explain, you know, how you go about doing things. 
I believe you're on the second edition of the book now. Have you just are you in the process of writing it? Tell us about this second edition. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, when I wrote the first edition, I didn't think that it was going to be 254 pages long. I was actually quite surprised, and I think a lot of it is really good stuff. If I if you don't mind my saying, but um, I didn't expect to come up with even a third of the material. So I get to the end of the book, it's 254 pages, and I've got a backlog of stuff that, just so that I could ship it, I got a backlog of stuff before I published the first edition, before I put it out, and I thought, you know, this is going to come out in the second edition. I wanted to talk about metacognition, you know, thinking about thinking and workflowy. I wanted to talk about collaboration, but never had much of a chance to collaborate with anybody. Well, um, almost a year after the fact, I've had a chance to collaborate with a bunch of people. So I'm sort of tacking on a lot of stuff that I've had a chance to, I had the opportunity to work through in the last year, actually. And one of the biggest blessings for me was becoming the workflowy blogger in residence. That was a huge, huge thing for me. I really feel fortunate about that. Um, I sent a, a copy of my book when it came out to um, Jesse Patel, one of the co-founders of Workflowy. And when he got his hands on my book, my PDF, he read a couple of pages. Um, he got in touch with me and he said, hey, Frank, you want to Skype? I'm like, uh, what do you want to Skype about? He says, I just want to see where you're at. <laughs> I'm thinking like, what is this? Is he going to like do a blog post about my book? So I can like just get kickstarted and, and sell a couple. And when we Skyped, I said, hey, Frank, how would you like to blog on the Workflow blog? I mean, I said, you've come up with so much material. It's like, I didn't know you could do this, some of this stuff in Workflow with my own app that we created. And um, he said, how about blogging for us? I said, yeah, I'll do it for free. And um, we, we've got this sort of agreement or this deal where I do weekly blog posts on the Workflow blog. And um, I get to give a little blurb at the beginning of each post about, you know, this, this is a guest post by Frank Dehema, author of the book, blah, blah, blah. And people can click on that and get ported through to my book landing page. So that is really amazing. That keeps uh, sales consistent. That was really, really, um, you know, this is a year down the line. And I still feel that I, it was such a lucky opportunity to actually uh, voluntarily sort of thing be their blogger in residence. And the, the reason I mention that is because of the last year, I've done a lot of posts, weekly posts. In the beginning, I did two posts a week. So there is tons of new good stuff that I've discovered with the help of a lot of, a lot of smart people, um, other people who create. Um, one of them that comes to mind is a guy who goes by the handle Robites. He's created a bunch of um, bookmarklets and Chrome extensions that really augment and extend workflow usability. And, you know, with a bunch of these really smart people, I've come out with some nice hacks. So it's not all me. It's come in collaboration with a bunch of people. Um, but I've had the opportunity to write a lot of nice stuff. And all of that, most of it, I'd say like 80% of the stuff I've put on the blog could potentially go into the second edition of my book. And I'm actually working on the second ed edition of my book right now. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm not rehashing and recreating all of that great stuff, like let's say collaboration and workflowy, or reading books and workflowy, um, or putting images or um, iframes and documents into workflowy. So we came up with a hack for that. So I'm not going to um, put all of that verbatim or even rework the material. What I'm doing is I'm creating chapters on that stuff that I've blogged about already, but I'm using the blog, the workflowy blog as a reference. So I'll link, I'll create a chapter on collaboration and I'll link to the blog posts that I've created on collaboration. And I think the Workflowy blog platform um, or any blog platform is a better show and tell. So you can put animated GIFs, you can put videos. It's a better show and tell than what I can get into a PDF. I mean, I created an interactive PDF and that's a whole other story. And I'm really happy with the results that I could, you know, I created in a PDF. But um, you can go a step further on a blog. You can put videos, you can put other audio visual material, which I've done in a lot of posts, which you cannot do in a book. So I think this is a kind of a nice trade off. And um, the second edition of my book is going to have what I've got is basically just takeaways. So I'll write about, um, let's say, collaboration and workflowy. I'll give a, a little a geeky introduction. And, oh, and um, I'll have two main sections, the takeaways. So in point form, I'll give people 
the sort of summary of the things they can take away from the post. And if they want to go and check out the post online, they can do that. And then I've got a final little subheading or subsection there, which is, uh, frankly speaking. So my name is Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think you're going to enjoy the little noun project icon I found for that. I, I really laugh every time I see it. It's, it's um, But I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, so I've got this little subsection called Frankly Speaking. And the whole idea behind it is that the Workflowy blog is not my, it's not my blog. It's the company blog. And I have to be diplomatic when I um, respond to, <laughs> when I respond to comments because I have to appeal to a wider audience. Um, and I think reading a blog post and sitting down and reading a book or a digital book and an ebook are, they're two different things. And people actually, a couple of people have emailed me. One person who I actually did an interview with on that workflow blog uh, goes by the handle. <laughs> a lot of these people like to remain anonymous, Dr. Andis. <laughs> and this is one of the biggest compliments I ever got about my book. He said, Frank, at the end of the, and this is a smart guy. So he said, Frank, at the end of the day, I sit down and I read your book for pleasure. I'm like, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> but, yeah. So um, I'm waffling a little bit here, but getting back on track, um, getting back to the workflow blog posts, I have to be a little, I have to sort of curtail, I should have sort of have to clip my wings a little bit there. So the whole thing about the frankly speaking um, thing that I, that I, the section that I put into each chapter that refers to a blog post or a series of blog posts, I can speak more candidly. I can speak my mind. I can be sarcastic. I can make jokes. I can be long-winded. Um, I can give my opinion about something. Once again, diplomatically, but a little bit more candidly speak about these sorts of things um, that shouldn't really go into a blog post, if that makes sense. That does make sense. And that's really, really very interesting. Um, it sounds like this collaboration between you and the guys at Workflowy is just mutually beneficial in a whole host of ways because I imagine you get a great deal of traffic and purchases of your book from the Workflowy blog and vice versa so um, that's brilliant. Um, I, I still like I, I've said this before I've mentioned this already I just cannot believe my luck even a year down the line. Um, Jesse and Mike they just let me do my thing on their blog and I, I don't know if I mentioned it to <laughs> to Jesse one day, I'm like, wow, you just trust me to put whatever out on your blog, you know? So I just give him a rundown of what I'm gonna blog about, um, basically, just the basics each week. Um, but I'm still like, my, my mind is blown that um, here's a creator of an, um, you know, the two founders, these creators of an amazing app and a popular app that would just let me do their thing, my thing on their blog. And I write about what I want within reason. But they've given me all the latitude to uh, you know, to do my thing, and that's amazing. I don't have any policing. I don't have them looking over my shoulder. I don't have them saying change up the title or change this or that. So that is really awesome. They just let me do my thing. That's incredibly freeing for a writer. So I can I can understand that. Frank, you are henceforth known as the workflowy guru. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I was it you who said that before. You keep calling me a guru. You are a guru. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take whatever I get. <laughs> it's been really interesting hearing about your, your journey through writing, publishing and selling a book. And now you're working on the second edition. When can we expect to see the second edition? Hard to say. I keep promising people and it keeps going like a week, uh, pushing it a week forward. But I'm determined to get this done within the next three weeks. I've made a lot of headway. I think I've written up about 50 percent of the new stuff. Um, and, you know, from the perspective of having completed a first edition and how thorough and how um, all encompassing it was now, after another year, I'm, what, that wasn't all encompassing. There's so much more. And I think a year from now, um, this is not just new use cases for it. This is new abilities that you can use Workflowy for, new ways of, totally new ways of doing things. I'm not saying like, oh, I discovered that you can use Workflowy to do journaling or you can use Workflowy to create a bucket list. Not just new stuff like that, but totally new dynamics and new um, abilities in Workflowy. And I'm just really amazed at what, um, and I think this is most of like the really cool stuff that has developed over the last year. 
in terms of hacks and getting squeezing out of workflow much, much more is I, I think it's been a bit of a community effort. A lot of people write me. I've done a lot of interviews. I've done an interview with Michael Hyatt. I've done an interview with a whole bunch of people um, for the Workflow blog. And that's put me into touch with some really smart people, as I've mentioned before. Um, but there's this sort of sharing of ideas. And I think um, I couldn't have come up with a lot of these hacks or, or ways of presenting them without the input from so many other people. So this is really, I think the second edition of the book is going to include a lot of stuff that was... Um, looks like Frank on the surface, like, wow, he's a guru. Look at the amazing things he did. But a lot of the, the, the stuff behind the scenes, a lot of the technical things, um, like some scripts that you can use with certain extensions, that wasn't me. I don't know how to code. And um, all the credit goes to them. I credit these guys in the posts that I've put out, but I wouldn't be able to come up with such amazing stuff if it wasn't for the amazing hack. So it looks like Frank on the surface, but it really is very little to do with me. It's just me pa packaging it and saying, this is what you can do. Here's a couple of animated GIFs and putting a writer's spin on it. So this is less of me uh, and more of the workflow community. I'm very excited about the second edition. I can't wait to get my copy when it comes out. So what's next for you, Frank? What's next on the horizon? Well, um, besides the second edition, which is going to be done, I think I'd like to get it done within the month, three to four weeks. Um, I'd like to create some video tutorials. By the end of the year, a lot of people over the last year have been saying, how about some videos? How about some more audio visual stuff? And I think that's what I'm going to get on to, and I'd like to try and finish by the end of the year. Um, and then there's our project. There's our project. Yes, indeed. Starting Starting January. Frank and I are planning to, well, planning, we are going to collaborate on a book we're going to be writing together in January. I'm not going to divulge too much information about that at this stage, but suffice to say, I'm very much looking forward to it. And roll on January. Yeah. Um, so you're not going to divulge anything? Should we just maybe give some hints as to what it's about? Um, how big of a hint? Like the whole general concept? <laughs> I, I think, I tell you what I think would be a good hint is that earlier in the interview, Frank, you mentioned that you are an English teacher. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I, my listeners know that half of my week is spent teaching as well. And a lot of the writing that I do is sort of teaching orientated writing. So we thought it would be a good idea to take our shared background in teaching and write about it. But we're not going the stand up in a classroom and talk type teaching angle. This is something completely different. Do you think that's enough of a teaser? I think that's it. I had mentioned a, um, a couple of weeks back or a month back. Um, how about we do the sort of he said, she said thing. So we get two perspectives on any one topic. And of course, there's stuff that um, you specialize in that I have no idea about. Like I've never done a podcast. This is my first time I've ever... I've been invited to an interview of any sort anywhere. So this is totally new to me. Never spoken like this before. Um, and I can learn a lot. And I think those are things that you can teach me. That's what you specialize in. And I think we'll, in this book, draw on one another's strengths. You know, the things that both of us are good at. Sort of do like a mind meld. You know what a mind meld is? I, I, well, I'm looking forward to experiencing one. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's interesting. I think collaboration has been a real theme throughout this interview. And um, I think that that's in, in business, collaboration is one of the most important things you can do. So um, maybe there's a title for the podcast in there somewhere. I don't know. Frank, it's been an absolute pleasure, as always, talking to you. Is there, is there anything we've forgotten to say? Let's see. Um... Oh, I've remembered something. Where can people find you online? I will make sure that all of your links are in the show notes, but would you like to just let people know where they can look you up online? Well, I've got my blog, productivitymashup.com. That's not as active as I'd want it to be. I think you mentioned some time back that my blog sort of became uh, the victim of my success with Workflowy and by success that I'm blogging for these guys. So you can find me on the Workflowy blog. Um, you can find a lot of my tinkering and uh, musings on productivitymashup.com. And my book landing page is all tied in there too on my blog. 
brilliant and as i said there'll be no there, there'll be links on the show notes i highly recommend the book so please go check it out thank you so much for your time today frank you're welcome lovely talking to you likewise ciao ciao